Right, so let's just uh, wait for another minute or two to see if there's uh, anybody else joining, and uh, we'll start shortly. Hi everyone, um, so let's start. And um, so uh, while confirming who's here from the team, um, would it be possible to uh, display on the screen um, the agenda for today um, while we, we uh, make a call? So I see Andre, Bill, uh, jean uh Jean, and Rani. Um, joining the call from the Chris team, and of course we have um, the observers uh, from the community who are always welcome. And uh, so let's start. So um, uh, may I confirm with, um, well I see Herman's name, but perhaps uh, um, I heard um, from Herman that he cannot join due to his trouble. So um, I assume somebody from the NRO Secretariat is joining us to help facilitate the call, so thank you very much. Um, so I have uh, circulated the agenda, the draft agenda, to the um, global analyst, and I wonder if they could be displayed um, on the screen. Oh, hello, Loriana. So, um, so while we wait for that to be shown, um, I'll try to go through based on my, um, according to my memory. So we'll go through the agenda review and the actions from the last. Um, since the last call, uh, we'd like to cover about, uh, well, and then we'd like to hear the update from our community, um, especially we have the right meeting and a LAC meeting, uh, so we're very interested to hear if there are any notable discussions from there. And then uh, we'd like to um, also um, confirm how we're going to handle um, the feedback that we are receiving from the global, um, global analysts, uh, especially on the SLA. So that's uh, related to the community feedback. And then um, um, the next point on the agenda that I'd like to cover would be um, the quick uh, comments to the SLA um, that uh, Andre has uh, helpfully um, uh, share, you know, done the analysis and shared the review with the Chris team. So let's just uh, confirm um, the major points to be covered, including the next steps uh, and the timeline and how we share this with the community before submitting to the um, to the NRNC. Um so that's um, so that's another point on the agenda and then I would also like to cover um, what we'd like to discuss with the um, NRNC uh, with their meeting oh no no so before we go to this I'd like to discuss about the update on the CWG proposal um, that we have submitted the comments. Um, so we're done with this um, submitting with the comments, but is there anything else to follow up? Um, I'd like to cover that. And then lastly, I'd like to talk about um, the agenda items um, that we'll have with the NLEC um, with the meeting that we have um, this Friday. So, um, it may have been a little bit difficult to follow verbally, but you, sh you should be able to um, see what it says on the agenda item from the, the mailing list, um, the INS Global mailing list. Uh, so the, the agenda is listed here. So let me see if there's um, any other points that you'd like to cover from the call um, today. I actually have... 
Sorry, um, did somebody want to raise something? This is Bill. Uh, since I haven't been on a call since the congressional hearings two weeks ago, I thought that I would uh, offer to brief on that. Excellent. So that will be. Um, so let's uh, let's put this. Maybe after the feedback from the community, I uh, will go to you, Bill, to um, hear your update about the congressional hearing. So thank you very much. And then um, I also have something to add uh, as well. Um, um, as you're probably aware, the ICG has um, made a request to the three operational community on how much time it's, uh, we expect it to take in the implementation. We're supposed to submit this uh, plan by the end of June. And while we haven't officially received this request from the ICG yet, apparently they're planning to send this request to um, the Chris team soon. So I'd like to um, discuss how we handle this as well. Thank you, yes, agenda is visible now. So um, let's go to the first point on the agenda, so actions review, um, so notes from the last meeting. I got an update from her man that he's working on them and uh, they should be ready by uh, tomorrow. So this is not yet posted, uh, but um, you know, it's recognized as uh, something that needs to be worked on. And uh, 2B, submission of comments to the ICG proposal. So uh, I already submitted this and uh, as you can see from the later point of the agenda, we'd like to um, pull up a little bit on any of the further actions needed. So let's go to uh, agenda three, community discussions. So um, anything notable from the right meeting, the LACNIC meeting, and I believe APRNIC meeting is happening. Is it uh, this week or, or was it last week? Uh, I'm not very sure, but so anything notable from the RIL meetings? If um, nothing notable, I would expect the report will be um, shared as the last um, two meetings, the APNIC meeting and um, an ARA meeting, um, to be shared on the NR website, um, especially re related to the SLA, so we can confirm um, what needs our attention and things like this. Um, anything else from other regions? I don't see any hands. Oh, Bill? I just wanted to say that I was very happy to see that LACNIC uh, board passed a resolution similar to those of uh, AFRNIC and uh, uh, Aaron um, regarding expectations around the uh, SLA feedback. Yes, indeed, Bill, yes. Um, I, I was very happy to see this as well. So we were seeing very consistent message across um, multiple RIRs, so this is very encouraging. Thanks, Bill. Um, so let's go to the global list. Um, so I think the global list has been focusing a lot of discussions on the SLA, and um, I think Andre has um, incorporated the key uh, feedback from the community on the global list on the SLA. So we can probably cover that. And um, so, and then what I'd like to highlight a little bit is this question from Vince Surf about it, whether there's a fallback mechanism. Um, available um, when when we change the ion operator. So I would expect this is more of a question that um, RIR may be more suitable to answer, but um, if we have any observations related to this, um, um, I, I'd like to hear from the Christine. I'm not seeing any hands, so um, maybe this is something to be covered at the um, at the meeting with the NREC this Friday to confirm what their thoughts are, and then we can share our observation um, to that. To clarify, are you asking whether any of us have thoughts on Vince's uh, proposal regarding the fallback position? Yes. I, I I would just say that I think it's an excellent thing. I mean. The amount of work involved for us is, uh, or sorry, for the numbers community as a whole is microscopic and the, it's a big win. And I think it also helps us to get across to other people just 
how small a task the INF function is with regard to our community. Mm -hmm. Yep, indeed. So I actually uh, found, um, um, you know, uh, sharing of the situation from um, Hans Peter Holland to be very helpful. That he he actually clarified that, you know, it might seem like a big thing if you don't know the details, but actually what's needed is not like that substantial, and uh, it can be easily addressed. Um, so that seems to be the the message that's being um, discussed on the list. So that's my impression, and. Um, Happy to hear any other observations if you have. Uh, so thanks, uh, Bill, for uh, making this comment. And um, so I'd like to, um, as 3D, I'd like to quickly uh, reconfirm the Chris team's role in the SLA discussions. So we have already, I think, uh, generally agreed um, from the past uh, call that um, we will not be making any evaluation of each of the individual comments but rather, as Andre has done, we will incorporate um, the comments that we consider as relevant um, and uh, regarding you know, consistency with the numbers proposal, um, we will uh, in, um, reflect them in our comments to the NROEC and then submit this uh, to the NROEC. So that's what we um, expect um, as the role of the CRISP team. And um, at the last meeting with the NROEC, um, they have agreed that they will actually share the table of each of the individual comments that has been posted on the global INR list so that the community is able to confirm how their comment has been uh, addressed and uh, whether or not reflected in the, um, on the future version of the SLA draft. So this is actually still not um, out on the public but this is actually the plan. So I think in combination of this and um, us incorporating any feedback that is uh, relevant um, from the consistency um, of the numbers proposal and reflection in the SLA, that should um, pretty much accommodate um, the community's feedback. And um, so I'd like to first confirm if there's any other questions or um, disagreement about this um, this summary. Okay, I see no hands. So I think this will basically be what we um, share with the um, NREC this Friday and uh, confirm their understanding. And once we're done with this, then we communicate this to the global list. So um, good, so let's uh, go, go to um, Agenda four, SLA review as the Chris team. And um, so, Andre, um, would you mind to um, give us a brief um, summary of the work you've done and anything to highlight from your analysis? Sure. Thank you, Zumi. So, I, I sent the first uh, uh, cut of the draft uh, response to the SLA or analysis, as we call it. Uh, the main approach I've taken uh, was based on the discussion we had on, uh, in the team, um, that is limit the scope of the analysis to the conformance of SLA uh, provisions to the principles of the CRISP proposal um, and not going to you know, some legalities that uh, we decide outside of the scope of the CRISP team. Also taking the approach uh, of going uh, principle by principle to make it more explicit rather than taking uh, SLA provisions as the starting point. So what I did, I reviewed all the principles and uh, tried to find appropriate clauses in the SLA um, and then um, analyze if uh, those clauses are conformant to the principles or not. Um, I think the general feeling is that uh, they are <laughs> There are some details that probably we would like to recommend to be included uh, in the SLA. I also uh, looked at the comments submitted on the mailing list from the community with regards to SLA and uh, tried to incorporate some of them. But as I mentioned on my email, uh, some of them I felt were outside the scope of this analysis because they went really in the legal uh, matters like you know dispute resolution and so forth. Um, and some of them, I think there were probably one or two that I couldn't just fit in. 
Um, but as we agreed, that's not a, a consensus position of the community. That's a consensus position of the CRISP team. So I think uh, uh, those comments that were sent on the list uh, will be taken on board by the RIRs anyway. And I think the more comments we incorporate, it just makes our position stronger. That is, that is my take on that. Thank you, Andre. I, I very much uh, agree with this uh, basic approach and um, the, the, um, in also the analysis that you made on um, the observation. So, um, so from what I understood, I think some, some of the key um, points, such as um, termination and renew, we observed that uh, it's pretty much consistent with the, the numbers proposal. But um, there are some points that need further clarification, such as there was a part that um, it seemed to hint that we stick with the single uh, operator among the three operational communities. So we want to make sure that we, we, give, we still give a room in case we, we change, like um, the, only the numbers are changed operator. And I think another point that I found was um, notable was that I think there was a mention about the need for um, coordination with um, other operational communities. Um, I can't remember what exactly was the occasion from the top of my head, but um, so but I think you pointed out that um, why is this needed and it needs more um, further um, clarification from this. Um, yes, exactly, and I think, uh, sorry? Yeah, sorry, sorry, uh, no, please go ahead. Yeah, I think some of the places it's, uh, it's a little bit confusing and not consistent in some of the places. Uh, the SLA assumes there might be multiple operators in some other places. SLA assumes there is only one single operator. I think we need to be more flexible and not cut this in stone in any way, but in any way be consistent. Um, and um, another thing with regards to coordination, I think we need to make sure that this doesn't, you know, uh, drag us in the policy space. So this coordination, the scope of this coordination is very well defined. Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah, I agree with your comments, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you. And um, so, any other comments? Um, any um, related to the review that Andre has shared? Uh, so, Bill has made a, a comment on the chat that we and protocols are very clear that, the, that a structure that allows different operators is mandatory. Yes, yes, indeed. And um, um, and. Yeah, I recall Esteban um, and perhaps Bill has comments. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Um, uh, thanks to, uh, to me, uh, but I not have uh, I not have any comments at at this stage. I was working in the dispute dissolution clauses, but I am not uh, ready for for share my my comments now. Okay, understood. Um, Bill, um, do you have any other comments? Yeah, I think my my single biggest problem with the SLA uh, is that it includes this automatic renewal, which the legal team inserted without any direction from us, and that is a huge change of direction relative to the status quo. Um, and my understanding is that we're working from the basic principle that we try to change as little as possible from the status quo other than that this reports to us rather than reporting to NTIA. And the periodic recompetition has been, I would say, the single most useful mechanism that NTIA has had to discipline the IANA operator in that the only real incident in which they have disciplined them was the 2011 time when they came back and said in response to a periodic recompete that there were no acceptable uh, proposals, that were no proposals that met the multi-stakeholder community's minimum requirements. Now, if NTIA can do that for us, but we're no longer allowed to do that for ourselves, that's a huge step backwards. And I know that I can lobby very heavily to get that added, but the SLA drafting was supposed to be from our side representing our position prior to negotiation. So I think it is, 
absolutely necessary that we pull that back out so that the SLA reflects our principles, not our principles as amended by ICANN's negotiating position. Okay, thanks, Bill, all for, for sharing this. And uh, if what you described is, is true, I think this is something that needs to be looked at and um, highlighted. So my quick observation before I open the floor to others is that, so it is true that it says automatic renewal, but it does give us the right to, to, um, to open the bid to another operator. So that's my understanding. So it seems that automatic renewal is more of a procedural um, way, and but we are still able to choose another operator. But so let's uh, that's just my quick observation. But I'd like to um, maybe first um, give a chance for somebody from the legal team to um, give their explanation, and then also afterwards follow up with anybody else uh, with further comments. So um, I think. Maybe Michael, you may be the only one from the legal team who's joining the call today. So, would you be able to explain um, it, whether Bill's observation is uh, is true and um, and why is this uh, reflected in this way? Yes, Azumi, thank you. Um, so, the mechanism by which we have the automatic renewal, I think both you and Bill both see the different sides to it, and that is that. Um, it is an automatic renewal in the sense that if everybody's happy with the way things are going, then it will just automatically renew for another term period. But you do also point out the fact that there is the opportunity to terminate the contract and to choose not to renew it. So we felt that this was at least um, consistent with the Chris team uh, proposal and the principles in the sense that um, it didn't you know, obligate us to have to renew or to stay with um, with the particular operator. But in the sense of kind of stability, it also makes sense that if there's nothing wrong or you don't feel that there's any issue there, then it could just automatically renew. So in the sense of if, let's say, for example, we wanted to have a rebid, then you could do so. You just have to make sure you do it in the time period that allows for it. And that's why we put it in there. And obviously, feedback from the community, the legal team and the RIR staff will We'll definitely take that to heart and and consider what you know what ways we can accommodate uh, community feedback on this. But we felt that this was a good balance in the sense that um, it does allow for an automatic renewal, but it doesn't obligate a renewal. And and this is how a lot of uh, companies will do their contracts this way, so that if you do have a contractor that you're happy with, you don't have to change anything. Um, and that I think increases stability. However, it does give us the opportunity, one, if the operator is somehow breaching the contract, we can terminate. Um, that's definite right there. In, ten, in terms of the term, we do have the opportunity to rebid if we want to. So um, there are, it's different mechanism. I understand that there is the mandatory rebid and there is the, that principle that um, some people might want to have in there. And then we have this automatic renewal that allows us to rebid and it actually leaves it in our hands um, as the contracting party whether we want to do so or not. I mean, they could also opt to not renew as well, but um, but I think that hopefully strikes a good balance, but I'm happy to hear any comments and and we'll be, we'd be glad to take that back to the drafting team as we, you know, keep going through this draft. Thanks very much, Michael. So let's go to Narani. Thank you very much. Good to speak to you all again. Um, I'll, I'll make a general comment first, and then I'll, I'll comment on, on the uh, renewal part. Uh, so thanks, Andre, for for your work. That's um, I think that's it's really really good, and and um, I don't have that many comments. But I think I agree with most of the uh, observations in there. Um, if our task is just to see if uh, it's consistent with the principles set out in the proposal, then I, I think we uh, are well on the way. Um, as for the, the part about uh, the renewal, I, I certainly sympathise with, with Bill's concern uh, and the, the, um, the term auto-renewal uh, might raise some flags with some people, but um, I also think that both Izumi and uh, Izumi put it nicely and I think Michael clarified it, that I think if you look at the all the terms, um, all the paragraphs under Article 10, term and termination, 
I actually think all together, 10.1, 10.2, and 10.3, together they do represent uh, the CRISP team, uh, the, sorry, the number of proposals principle. Um, I can certainly understand to appease or to, to um, um, for the sake of stability, you do want to make, you want to send a signal as well that there is continuity here. But I think that there are certainly mechanisms in there that represent the, the number of communities proposal, uh, the principles in the proposal about giving the RIR the, um, the, the power to the control over the contract, so to speak. Um, the 10.2 gives them that, and also 10.3 with the right to terminate. And I think it does strike the right balance. We can talk about wording, but I do do think about. I think it strikes the right balance in terms of stability and continuity, but also in terms of of, of giving the RIR the um, option to change operator if there are there is reason to do so. Thank you. Thanks, Norani. And uh, let's go to um, Andre. And then um, let's see if any other comments. And then I'd like, I'll go back to Bill if you have further comments. So um, please, Andre. Excuse me. Well, I seem to recall our discussion uh, in the Chris team and also in the community uh, when we prepared the proposal that bidding was not specifically showing up. So I don't think this is the kind of underpinning uh, concept of, of this principle. Um, I think the underpinning concept was that we resolve accountability issue by having contract with the ability to terminate. I think our strong position was that there should not be a listed conditions for this termination. I think 10.2 covers that quite adequately. I would also like to notice that the bidding, it, it has costs. And I think we need to think to uh, to have this cost proportional to the service we are acquiring from the IANA operator. I think maybe Chris team is not really in position on um, kind of incurring those costs on the community, which might not be insignificant. Thank you, Andre. Um, any other comments? So before I go back to um, Bill and see if he has further comments. Okay, so if no, no one else, then uh, let's go to Bill. Well, okay, so two things. The first one I said before, let me just try and say it more clearly. Our starting principle was that we were going to make the minimum possible number of changes vis-a-vis -vis the status quo um, and that we were going to have reasons for the changes and that, um, you know, we're, we were not going to just sort of rewrite everything from scratch. This is a huge change vis-a-vis -vis the status quo, and it did not originate with the CRISP team. This is not a change that we decided to make. Therefore, I think that we should not get backed into this change just because it's something that I can want. I can want lots of things, right? But we should not mess with multiple variables at once, especially if we don't have some inherent independent reason of our own for wanting this change, okay? That's point number one. Point number two is that if you get rid of the automatic recompetition, it's a polarizing function. It pushes everyone to extreme positions because we then cannot get a view of the state of the art. We cannot find out what industry is willing to offer us without saying that we are displeased with what we have. We can't just find out what might be better. Whereas if we have an automatic recompete every five years, the world will tell us what's available to us. And if we like what we've got, then no problem. If we don't like what we've got, then we have information on which to base a decision. Um, if we have to call for that every five years by saying that we're unhappy with what we've got, it's, it makes for a stressful relationship and it does not give the existing operator any reason to stay aware of the state of the art, right? All they have to do is make us complacent. They don't have to 
actually produce something as good as other people could produce. So those are my my points here. And I think ultimately it's the first one that matters most, right? This is a change that did not originate with us that violates our minimum change principle. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bill, for, for sharing this. And um, so I think many of us um, you know, share your um, concern that we may be, you know, pressured, um, you know, in, uh, into giving in to ICANN's uh, intentions, and we certainly don't want to do that. Um, so just just to be clear, I, I think we are given a choice to to bid uh, if we want to. So um, yes, yeah, automatic unless we actually say so. But if we actually feel that we do, we would want to have this um, opportunity for bidding um, for a new operator um, um, at every um, term of the contract, we can certainly do that. But um, if we don't feel the need for that, then we we can go for the automatic renewal. So that's my um, so it gives us like uh, more flexibilities and and, um, and choices. So that's my understanding of um, the con um, of this. Contract, but I'd like to hear um, if my interpretation is um, is um, is um, correct. Um, first, with uh, Michael, and then also um, I'd like to hear from the others as well. Uh, so let's go to um, actually I think John has hand. So let's go to John first, and then maybe uh, Michael can explain if my observation is is, uh, is correct. And then I'd like to hear from the others from the team, including uh, Bill again, if he has comments. Yeah, so it might oh. just be kind of a. Oh. Narani, you want to go first? Hello? Yeah, sorry, I didn't realize. Um, Narani, would you like to go first? Sorry, I, my, my new session didn't work, but go ahead, I'll speak after you. Thank you. Okay, mine's just a real quick point um, or a question, kind of, I guess. Um, if you put in there that there that there has to be a rebid every five years, then I, I think you really have to because there's going to be there might be people out there that want to force that and they want to bid on it. And so then I, I think I don't think you can just say, well, we're not going to do that even though we're bound to do it. And that whole process would have to happen. And I think to Andre's point, where does the you know how are we going to be funding this kind of stuff? So. Um, kind of a question, but also a point. Maybe Bill can address it uh, when he talks again. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, John. So I think that's pretty much consistent with um, the point that I made earlier as well. So let's go to Nurani. Thank you. I'm, I'm struggling to <laughs> activate my mute button. Uh, thank you. No, uh, well, I was going to make uh, well a couple of points. I, I agree with with uh, with John's comment as well. If we put it in there that there'll be a rebidding, I, I think that that means that uh, we we have to uh, have that as a default. Um, and and my I'm not a legal expert, but my interpretation of of this clause is is um, that. This is quite a normal thing to have in, in, a, in a contract. You have to have me mechanisms to, to change the arrangement. Uh, and if there's no need to change the arrangement, uh, the, the contract, the, the relationship continues. And then just um, finally, because I think this point is, is quite important. The, the RIR legal teams have been very, very clear when presenting this to us and presenting uh, the draft SLA to the community that the draft SLA, as it stands now, is only a result of the legal team, the RIR legal
Did we hear anybody? No, Ronnie, um, somehow we're not able to hear you. So I can hear you, John. Yeah, um, maybe. So, no, Ronnie, maybe uh, we'll go back to you again. Um, so uh, I'm sorry. So we heard up the part about the RIR legal team has uh, tried very hard to be consistent with the numbers proposal. So that's the part that um, I heard. Yes, maybe Nurani, you can uh, try to type in the chat, and then we'll go back to you again. So I see hand from um, Andre. So let's go to Andre. So, so one thing that was explained to me by some members of the legal team is that SLA covers relationship between um, IANA operator and uh, the areas, right? So many things are actually outside the scope of this SLA. From this point of view, I know operators shouldn't care how the contract is renewed and whether it's renewed through a bidding process or not. I think this is outside the contract. And um, while I don't know from the top of my head, but it seems to me that NTIA contract doesn't include the bidding as a contractual requirement. It's just the NTIA procedure that requires bidding to renew the contract. So I think we can apply the same. And if we feel strong about that, I think we can bring this to the community and discuss this with the community. And if so, we can address this in the same way how we address the missing IPR clauses, uh, i.e. say that something about this should be documented as the outcome of this process. Okay, thanks, Andre. Um, so should we try to go back to Nurani again? Right. All right. I, I so Nurani is, is to maybe uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Noted. So she's probably trying to rejoin it again. So I think the observation so far is that um, so we are actually given a choice to rebid if we need to, but automatic renewal gives us more like a choice in terms of cost and stability. But um, Bill, I, you might have um, further thoughts um, on the comments from the others. Andre is absolutely correct that it is a procedural matter rather than a contractual matter that the rebid occurs. Uh, however, U.S. government contracting process makes the rebid um, essentially mandatory in this. Well, I mean, I think they can choose under very specific circumstances not to rebid, but the legal uh, controls over that are very aggressive. So essentially, they will always go out with an RFP. Um, sole sourcing something under U.S. government contracting process is really difficult. So you're right, it's procedural, not contractual, but they have that process and we don't. So I understand that this is different from the, um, you know, the current situation, but what exactly do you think would be a, a concern or the implications if we go to the automatic renewal, given that we do have the option and the ability to, to do the renewal, if, um, the, the rebid if we want to. So I'd like to understand a little bit more about, um, you know, in addition to the fact that it's different, what exactly would be the concerning implications that you think, though? Because it requires us to express a level of displeasure that we have politically been unwilling to do in the past. I think we'll be driven into apathy. I doubt that we will actually find out what better offers the world has to give us because in the past we've just kind of gone along with whatever I can did. I think that's unfortunate. Whereas NTIA has not just gone along with whatever I can did. NTIA actually stood up for our community, right, and said that ICANN was not sufficiently meeting the needs of the multi-stakeholder community. I have never seen us do that. I'm worried that if we have a less strong position than NTIA, and we also have less backbone in this matter, that we're going to wind up in a very bad position. That's it. 
Okay, right. So um, I understand the point you're making a little bit more clear. So your assumption is that in case that um, this rebit is only possible um, if um, if we have any like uh, dissatisfaction or like um, un, you know something not we're we're not happy with the ICAN. So you think that this will be the condition for the rebit, and that's the concern. Um, that's the point that you're concerned about. Um, is it a fair understanding? Not exactly. If we don't make it the default, calling for it sends a message. It's a message that we've never been willing to send in the past, whereas NTIA has. Send a message. Um, I'm sorry, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I understood what you mean by send a message. Okay. So, so if the default is that there's no reason. If the default is that there's no competition, okay, and we suddenly say, okay, but this time we're going to compete it, is that sending a message that the status quo is not okay? Right? That's a message we've never been willing to send in the past, but NTIA has. So NTIA has more backbone in this regard, and also they have a structural process that ensures the three competition will happen, right? We do not have a structural process, and we've never challenged ICANN in that way. I don't see that we're ever going to actually do this. So making it optional is very close to saying it's never going to happen, which is exactly what ICANN wants. And if, if, if any of us have any reason to want that, I'd love to hear about it. But I haven't heard anything that is a reason why we would want it. I've heard lots about, oh, stability, oh, we could do it if we want to, but I haven't heard any reason why this is in our benefit. And we're supposed to be structuring this at the beginning, at the outset of negotiation. We're supposed to be stating our position and what we want, right? If we walk into a negotiation with a position that is already compromised and already includes what the other party wants, then everything else they want is going to go further in their direction. Right? We, we need to walk in to the negotiation with a statement of what we want, not a statement of what we think they want. Yeah, okay. I understood that you assume that this is something that I can want. Um, so before I you know, make any, any further comments, let's go to the others. Um, so let's go to Nurani and then um, Michael. Apologies, I'll, I'll try to... Um, I, I think I've had, had connection problems, so I'll try to again what I'm saying. Uh, my very main point was really about um, that the URL legal team is very, very clear about that when they put out this draft SLA, they did it purely based on their, their interpretation of the proposal as legal experts, taking the proposal, translating it into legal text. Um, they were very clear about, they publicly stated that um, there have been no modifications or incorporations of any uh, comments made by or dis potential desires by the NROEC, and there have been no incorporations made by um, uh, potential desires from ICANN. So I think we need to be really clear about um, what message we're sending as well when we're talking outside of this group. Um, I trust the RAR legal teams in, in that uh, when they say that they've created this text purely based on the draft proposal. And I do think it does represent uh, the, the, the principles in the proposal. Um, so um, I, I think we need to be a little bit careful about, about insinuating that it is here because of potential desires that I can um, have. Because by doing that, so we are... We are um, but we are disqualifying the RAR legal team. I also think that we had very, very lengthy discussions about these principles when we, when we drafted the proposal about this particular balance, both, both um, how much we wanted to say in the principles, how clear we want it to be, but also how we strike this balance between continuity and stability. We do not we were very clear in the proposal too that we did not want to send a message that uh, this proposal 
can uh, or that this function can change at any time and and no without any notice or no um knows might know what controls the RIRs have but this needs to be explicit uh, but that the RIRs need to have a mechanism to change the arrangement should it not work out for some for some reason uh, we had lots of discussions about this and we came up with a language that everyone was happy with um, so I would like to know, apart from um, our own concerns at this very late uh, stage of the process, I'd like to know in what way um, do you think that the text that the legal team has, in what way does it not represent the discussions we had behind those uh, principles, term and termination? To me, that's not clear. I, I certainly understand your concern about um, how altering new might be perceived by some, that word. I certainly understand your concern uh, with, with ICANN and potential changes ICANN certainly may want to uh, make in the negotiation process. I'm completely uh, with you there. But it's still, not, I, I, it's still not particularly clear to me in what way you think that the text that's in the draft uh, conflicts with uh, the, what was in uh, what we worked through in the proposal. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Melanie. So let's go to um, Michael, and then um, I don't know if Bill has further comments. Um, so um, let's go to Michael first. Yes, thank you, Zumi. I know there's a lot of uh, discussion about this point, and um, I just a couple of things I wanted to clarify and hopefully give some of the feedback from the legal team. Again, um, this is in the middle of a drafting process, so we do welcome everybody's comments and feedback because um, kind of along the lines of what Narani was saying, uh, this is a document that originated with the legal team. Um, there was no discussion with ICANN or even the um, the NRO EC or the you know the RIR CEOs, um, the draft that you all are seeing was really from what the legal team had come up with, and so a couple things to make clear, um, you know one I know there was this statement about how if we needed to rebid we would have to express some dissatisfaction and I know that by default it seems that um, if we did if we didn't rebid all the time and then we suddenly did that that would somehow send a message, that very well may be the case I think politically but what the legal teams um, concern here really was, was to make sure that there were mechanisms that would protect the, uh, the RIRs as the contracting parties in this contract. So um, whether it is an expression of displeasure or not, or the mechanism by which you would do the rebid, that's a very political side of it. And um, we do have the mechanism in here to do so. So the RIRs do have the power. And, you know, one, one side of the way of looking at it is that you could do right from the beginning um, it gives us the option for rebid, and we can say if we want to rebid or not, regardless of whether there's just displeasure. Um, I think it's it's incumbent on the RIRs and the community to express that dis displeasure. But um, from the legal team's perspective, we have provided the mechanism to do so. Now, whether the, the um, RIRs exercise it, that's really up to them. But um, but the mechanism is there, so we do have the opportunity to recompete. Um, in terms of why we would want to have this, this kind of process. I think there have been a couple of points, and these are points that were actually discussed um, by the drafting team as well, some of them. You know, Andre brings up the point of, a, of the cost, and I think, you know, a global, global rebid process does have some inherent cost in it. You know, there's, there's the time and, and funding that you need to worry about. Um, in terms of stability, we, have, we looked at that and said, well, if there's no reason from our side to see that we need to go look for another, um, another operator, that's another option and that's another reason why we did so. Um, we wanted to strike a balance that gave a, the opportunity to, to protect our interests while at the same time maintaining the stability side. Uh, so when we say is it, you know, in, uh, I guess consistent with the SLA principles, the legal team was very specific in that we took the, the CRISP proposal and we looked at the high-level principles. There were specific itemized numbers with the SLA principles, and we, we did our best and we tried to do as much as we could to maintain that we were consistent with those principles. I think that's what we did, but we are happy to hear any feedback from everybody as well. 
Um, but I do want to make sure that everybody knows this was purely by the, um, the efforts of the drafting team. There were no negotiations at this stage. And just, just keep in mind, at some point there will be. But at this point, there were no um, negotiations with ICANN, and it didn't even, we don't even have the feedback from the RAR CEOs at this point yet. Um, so we want to make sure that was purely our, on our efforts and that um, if we do have a rebid, it does not require any kind of um, specific statement uh, of displeasure with how the service is being provided. However, um, I know politically there may be some implications for that, but to be honest, the legal team was really looking at the mechanisms by which we could do it contractually. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much, Sean Michael, for clarifying that there was no involvement or um, um, negotiations either from ICANN or even the NRO. So this is purely the work of the legal team. And um, so I think this is left up to us whether... Um, so my understanding is that, you know, practically, even if it says on the SLA automatic renewal, if we want to do it every time, um, after the term of the contract, we can do so. And this does not have to be the reason because we have any, you know, dissatisfaction with the service. We're, we, we can totally do this because maybe we want to seek for a better, I don't know, service in terms of quality or cost or things like this. And I, I do still see Bill's point that, you know, if we do the rebit, then even if we don't say so, it may show dissatisfaction with, their, with the service and uh, or we are, there's something that we're not happy with the ICANN. But um, what I don't understand what this uh, will cause an issue. And uh, Bill just um, asked, what would be the benefit of um, having this automatic renewal? Um, so it does, so Bill thinks that this might benefit ICANN, but there's no benefit from, um, from the number side. And I think a couple of us has, has expressed that um, we want the stability, so unless there's a need for that, maybe we don't need to go for the rebate. And another point is that maybe there will be like uh, implications on cost and bidding. So those are the points that have been expressed. And um, um, I don't know if Bill, um, you have further additional like new comments related to this. And um, if, if if you know um, you don't have anything new to in terms of the um, the point. Maybe we'll just leave the discussions here at this point because I, I think it's just gonna go parallel. Um, um, but I'd like to confirm with Bill if there's anything else that you'd like to add in addition to the points that you have expressed or um, to the points that any of us has made so far. Nothing new. Okay. Um, and then you don't feel that um, any of your points have been addressed yet. Hmm. So let me confirm what your points are. So first, you feel that this is um, more of the interest for the ICANN and not from, for the interest for um, from the side of the, the numbers community. And second, you observe that this is a change from the status quo from the NTIA and why would we want to do that, which I think uh, Michael has explained, but um, I understand that you don't feel that um, this, um, this answers your uh, point. And I see a comment from the chat that tells the minimum change test, yes. Um, well, um, and there will did never... We, did we not start this process by saying that our position was that we were going to make the minimum number of changes to move the contract from NTIA to us. Am I misremembering that? Was that not our beginning principle? It is in terms of the IANA operation. So, um, so my understanding of this is that uh, we want to we want the stability of the IANA numbering services. That's why we we would want the minimum changes in terms of the implications to the the numbering services, okay. and that's why we want the existing operator. Okay, so minimum changes from the existing process, and we had our principles. We decided what changes. And, and so forth, we wanted to make, we enumerated those in the principles. We handed that off to the uh, legal team to come back with an SLA. The SLA that came back had a change that did not originate with us. 
Okay, this is a change from the status quo and it did not arrange, originate with us. Therefore, it should not be there. If we wanna make that change later, sure we can, but it should be the result of a conscious intentional process in which the community believes that there's an advantage to us in making the change. Not something where ICANN says that they want it and it magically appears, right? If they want it, they need to say so in a, as a part of the negotiating process. That's it. Yes. Um, so I think you're saying that the including the process, this this part has changed, and um, so um, I see the rationale of what you're saying, and I'm seeing hand from on the running again. But I'm also conscious of time as well. So we have four minutes left, and we do have other agenda to cover. So let me just um, confirm with others if we want to cover this. Um, plus other agenda, we might need another um, 30 minutes. So do we want to do this? Or um, maybe, so there are two, uh, three options. One is we, we cover this, plus um, hopefully other key agendas, such as uh, what we're gonna do for the next steps um, in terms of um, sharing this with the community and then um, maybe very key points related to CWG proposal. Um, and we, we'll try to do others online. The second would be um, we'll, we'll keep this and then maybe um, list each point um, that has been raised. And then um, we, we share this as our different opinions within the CRISP team um, with, with the global community. Um, and then try to quickly cover the rest of the agenda within um, the next 15 minutes. So, um, what would be your preference? Would you like to continue discussions on, on this? Um, so, I do see a hand from Nurani. So, um, maybe I'll go to you, Nurani, and, um, and then we can consider what we're going to do for for the remaining of the time. Thank you. I was, I was simply trying to be helpful, actually, in, in suggesting taking this to the mailing list, since we have other things to discuss. Uh, and there might be others who, who are not present here who, uh, who have opinions. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. So yes, I think we, we have covered both perspectives. And um, so Bill has shared um, your perspective and the others. So maybe you can summarize this and then continue discussions on the mailing list. And hopefully, if we're able to agree on this, that would be great. And if not, maybe um, when we share this with the community, maybe this is something that we share both perspectives and um, see what the, the community thinks. So this would be my suggested approach. And thank you, Nirani, for this, um, um, this suggestion as well. OK, so if no other. Oh, hand from Andre. Well, this is my question. Uh, so how do we want to reflect this in the analysis that we would like to share with the uh, community? Or would you like to discuss this in further steps with regards to the SLA response? Um, let's try to discuss more within the Chris team um, on the mailing list. And um, Yes, and highlights, as Bill said, just this portion, this particular part is, um, you know, there are two sides um, within the Chris team, and then we um, we describe the rationale for both of the, uh, both sides. So uh, what Bill thinks, and then what um, you know other Chris team members is, have expressed, and um, um, yeah, here's the feedback from the community. Okay, so I leave this section open, right, in, in our response. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we can maybe um, also discuss this with the, um, with the NREC. Well, we're not actually, like, um, you know, seeking for their comments or anything, uh, because we will be giving the feedback independent from, from them as well, uh, independent from them, but it's maybe worth um, sharing our observation at this stage. 
So to, to summarize, um, so we'll continue discussions on the mailing list and then uh, make sure that we hear from both sides of the argument. And if we can resolve this um, and reach an agreement, that, that would be wonderful. So we'll reflect this into our comments and to be shared to the, um, to the global community. But if not, then we share like points from both sides and um, hear what the community says. So that's my suggestion. I see no other hands related to this. Um, so I think this is the way to go uh, related to um, the SLA review. So, um, so yes, uh, exactly, Andre. So we decided to base our discussions on the crisp list on the coming days, and then we'll actually like write down you know arguments from both sides, um, and then try to resolve if possible. Um, so that's um, I think. Um, for A, and um, so I'd like to quickly confirm. Um, okay, so uh, Bill wants to clarify whether we want to do this um, with the CRISP team, team list and or the public list. So first, let's discuss within the CRISP team list, and then we would also seek, um, you know, ultimately we'd like to seek community input. So if we're able to reach an agreement within the CRISP team list, then we will reflect this agreement um, when we share this with the global community. Um, and if we're not you know, able to reach an agreement, then we share both sides of the argument to the global list. So that's my suggestion. So ultimately, we will share with the global list. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, I see no other um, comments or concern. So, okay. Then, um, so as a related point, let's go to 4B, um, confirm steps and timeline before submission. So my initial thought was um, maybe we'll seek further comments within the CRISP team um, until this week, so um, this Friday, and then we'll incorporate all the comments and then have this shared um, by next Monday, which is the 1st of June, and then um, give, um, um, let me confirm the exact date deadline for the comments. Um, does anybody know from the top of your head? Um, what, 3rd of June? No, 3rd of June, no, no, I think that's, um, I think that sounds very short. Um, I think it's a little bit later than that, according to my memory. Um, it would be great if, um, I'm checking this, but if, somebody happens to find out earlier than me, that would be great. Um, Fourteenth of June, so that's the date. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you, Andre, very much. Um, so we will give it um, one week um, for the community to um, give us the feedback. Um, so from the 1st of June until um, that Friday, so... Um, if, and then um, we'll incorporate this, have further discussions, um, and then um, we'll submit this on the 4th of uh, 14. But since we, we do have like, um, we do have, you know, different comments within the CRISP team, we may want to extend this time a little bit more for us to have discussions, um, maybe, I don't know, until they, Ninth um, next Tuesday, and then um, so we give it a, a week. No, no, no. So, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, second, second of June next Tuesday, and then um, we give it um, one week uh, until the ninth with the community feedback, and then um, until the twelfth we incorporate that, and then we submit this on the um, on the fourteenth. So let me write this down. Um,
Um, Nirani has to propose. Let's give the community whatever um, we've reached as consensus and um, bring open points for discussion. Yes, exactly. That, that's my point um, as well. I agree with you, Andre. So on 2nd of June, yes. Um, let's do this. And then I will give it a week for the community to comment, which would be um, 9th of June. And then we'll work on reflecting the community feedback and do the 12th. And then we we'll submit this to the NREC on the 14th. Does that work for everybody? I'll, um, I'll write this down, um, and then maybe we can confirm on the mailing list. So Bill is asking, did anyone have any other issues that weren't reflected in Andre's current draw document? Um, I think, um, are there any other open issues besides 10.1 automatic renewal? Yes, so I think we can um, hear the first team feedback online, including other comments, until next uh, Tuesday, 2nd of June. So it doesn't have to be only on this 10.1, but any other comments that um, the first team members have on the Andre's uh, analysis, then I think you know we can receive this on the mailing list. Yeah, okay, so I'm seeing agreement. Uh, so let's do this. And um, so we'll share with the global community on the 9th of June. Um, so that's the idea. Okay, so I'll share this um, on the mailing list uh, later so that everybody's comfortable with the schedule. Okay, good. So we're, we've covered um, 4A and B. Um, so just. Um, So Bill is saying that um, Bill was happy with everybody, everything Andre said. It was just one thing that wasn't said. Okay. Um, maybe you can, um, okay, sure, sure. Okay, understood that I don't need to um, read everything that you type. So I'll, I'll leave it to you to make further comments if needed. Um, so let's go to, um, Quickly go to five, follow up from the CWG proposal, and I'm still interested to hear um, Bill's update on the um, on the congressional hearing. Um, if every you know others can stay in, so um, let's really quickly go on five. Um, so we've submitted the um, CWG proposal to the names, and um, but we we still have um, some further work to do. One is that. Um, the analysis of the implications um, of them setting up PTI. So we need to compare what would be the pros and cons of us exchanging the, I, um, the, the SLA with the ICANN when they have the PTI, and what would be the pros and cons of us exchanging the contract directly with the PTI. So I think this is something that uh, we'd like the RAR to do the analysis because the other ones will be um, exchanging the contract and they would know better about the implications. So I'm, I'm planning to suggest this to the NREC um, that this is the analysis that uh, we'd like to um, to hear and uh, we'd like to share this with the names community. Yeah, thanks, Bill, for this suggestion about congressional hearing. Yes, um, so um, we'll add you to for the AOB. And um, so does everybody feel comfortable with this suggestion that um, we'll put this as agenda item for the meeting with the NREC? Um, I see no comments, so um, I would assume that uh, nobody have any concerns. And um, thank you, John, for confirming like um, an agreement. And we still need um, coordination on the IPR. So um, uh, Narani and I feel that we might want to go back to the IETF and uh, discuss with them about um, they've already expressed their willingness to accept the um, on uh, this um, intellectual property rights. Uh, to the IETF trust, but uh, we may want to um, discuss a little bit more on um, any other possibilities that we have, um, we may be able to 
to consider. And then, of course, we also want to discuss with the names uh, chairs as well. So um, as a next step, I'm planning to uh, suggest a, uh, a call with the IUTF uh, folks um, and then dis uh, discuss with them. And then depending on how the discussions will go, we'd like to suggest either a joint meeting um, between the three operational community chairs or a follow-up with the names chairs uh, on the further um, issues that they might have on the intellectual property rights. So that's my suggestion about the intellectual property rights. And of course, um, on the running end, I will keep you updated about anything notable about this issue. Anything else to add related to the IPR and future coordination on this? If no other comments, then um, let's go to um, quickly confirm. Um, so I think uh, we can go to six, and then we can confirm the agenda with the NREC uh, Christine meeting uh, online. So I'll share a draft of this, and then um, so we can um, circulate. Um, we'll circulate it, and you can make um, comments on this. Uh, and then. Um, Let's go to our congressional hearing, update from the congressional hearing. Okay, so Wednesday, two weeks ago, um, we had a uh, pair of congressional hearings, one in the uh, House Judiciary Committee and the other in the House, uh, what is it, like uh, Industry and Tra Commerce and Transportation. Um, Commerce and Transportation is the one that actually has oversight over NTIA, uh, judiciary is mostly interested in sort of legal issues. Um, there were eight people, uh, and, and I spoke on the, the judiciary one. My wife, Audrey, spoke on the, um, the transportation and uh, whatever one. Uh, there were eight people on mine. There were five people on hers, but 13 people uh, I was the only person from the names community, and there was no one from the protocols community. Uh, everybody else, essentially, uh, with just a couple of exceptions, was representing names. So it was kind of a uh, domainers versus uh, intellectual property people bloodbath. Um, uh, Basically, nobody was interested in the fact that there were three communities here, not just one. Um, and the message that I was trying to get across, which was that these three functions are inherently separable uh, from each other, not just from ICANN. Um, I got that across clearly, but there were not interested listeners in the room. So it's there on the record. Um, it, my testimony was gone over very, very carefully by uh, Aaron Legal and um, and John Curran, as well as, uh, you know, a bunch of other people on both the protocol and number side. Um, so the main thing that I learned from that is that the names community is representing these as not separable functions, uh, the, the numbers, protocols, and names, because they believe that if we do not stand with them, their negotiating power with ICANN will be diminished. This is a naive position on their point, uh, uh, a naive position on their part because they have not actually looked at the relative magnitude of the work, right? They are not, as I have and as, uh, you know, a number of other people have, we are contributing uh, half a percent of ICANN's budget, and we are receiving, um, like, on the order of a few hundredths of a percent of their expenditure. Um, so, uh the way the names people represented this on um, at the testimony on the record, they said that a piecemeal approach would leave a very small piece of the pie for the names community. 
So that very small piece of the pie is 99.95%. Um, they are determined to hold us hostage uh, for whatever minuscule additional benefit it gives them in their, their fight with ICANN. Um, so since then, I've been talking with a lot of other people from the business community, um, mostly the intellectual property side, about that and trying to get a little bit clearer with them that we are very small potatoes compared to their interests and that the relative importance of showing that the U.S. government is not holding up the process um, and that the U.S. government is not refusing to let everything go through on schedule um, is is a much greater benefit to everybody, right? If numbers and protocols go through on schedule um, and are recontracted re on October 1st, then it demonstrates to the world that um, the U.S. government was not holding up the process. And that's a, a significant danger because um, if the U.S. government does not appear to be acting in good faith here, other governments will try to move these things out of the multi-stakeholder process and into the ITU process. And that's ultimately what we don't want. So that, I think, is my summary of how those hearings went. Thank you very much, Bill. And uh, very interesting to hear the, the overall temperature and how the, you know, the, the, the interest within the Congress, uh, um, you know, relative to uh, for the numbers community relative to the others. And I think you've raised a, a very, um, you know, um, good point of, of future. Um, um, discussions which may be needed uh, in terms of um, what we go and um, um, in the next steps. So I think we might want to um, discuss first uh, within the Chris team um, about this um, future steps and um, maybe coordinate uh, officially with the other communities as needed. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Bill, for this update. And then, um, so I'd like to um, confirm um, the date of the next meeting, and uh, which is, I think, the 11th of, um, of June, which I think it's, it's nice because it's, because it's, um, it's uh, during what, on the period when we incorporate um, um, community's feedback, so we can actually you know, have face-to-face -face discussions on um, what we're going to do uh, to incorporate community feedback. And um, and so I think this uh, fits in nicely without the need for the additional call. So um, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining the call and uh, for uh, the extended time. So if uh, I'd like to see if there's anything that um, anyone wants to raise as a la one last point. Okay, um, so I'm not hearing any uh, comments. Well, I see some, you know, continued discussions on the chat related to the uh, update from Bill, and um, so I think this is uh, uh, something that we, we need to think about in our future steps. So um, thank you very much, and uh, so we'll discuss, continue to have discussions on the 10.1 um, of the SLA. Um, and and we'll talk to you again at the next call. So thanks very much. Thank you. Good to speak to you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.